if you might have been following Shane's work, you know he did a bunch of pictures in the 80s and early 90s, and then kind of fell out of favor with the studios. In your words, he kind of uh, it was harder to sell after the big, uh, certainly a payday success on Long Kiss Goodnight, but not necessarily the picture wasn't uh, what everybody hoped it was. Uh, yeah, is it important to be hungry when you come back in order to do what you're doing, uh, creating a movie? Yeah, because it's impossible to do. Um, and so you have to be ready for the long haul and for all the things that can go wrong. It wasn't really hard to come back and make a movie because of the su success or failure of one picture like Long Kiss Goodnight, which was it, uh, was a bomb. But what was hard was that I had taken time off. And I'd done a lot of things that sort of were on the periphery to sort of get out of the limelight and feel kind of protected and I was just sick of Hollywood. So then when you come back, there's a danger that you've taken a hiatus and they'll forget who you are. Um, you know, if you're giving a speech like this and you take a pause, people will sit there and they'll wait. But if I sat here for half an hour taking a pause, you'd probably just, you'd leave, right? And that's what happened essentially when I took too long a pause in the midst of, of what was otherwise a kind of lucrative career is that people said, who, what, oh, I don't remember him. And that's the danger in Hollywood. Not that, no one just, drops out and everyone sees him and says, oh my God, look, we lost Jerry. You know, it's not like that. It's like 10 years later, you say, hey, what happened to Jerry? And you say, I don't know, I can't quite remember. He did that project and after that, we don't know because you sort of fade out. And I had faded away a little bit. So I came back and all these doors were shut, which to me had previously been open. Um, but I had a script I liked, so I kept pushing. I kept getting turned down. And eventually, you know, I found this, I went back to Joel Silver yeah, it's like the scene in uh, Boogie Nights where Mark Wahlberg goes to Burt Reynolds at the end and he's lost everything. It's like, yeah, so no tears, but basically the same scene. Um, and I got lucky. Even up to the, the, day bef the week before we were supposed to start shooting the picture, we got canceled. <coughs> uh, we'd been canceled three times previous to that. So we had to do all the work, all the post-production, all the planning, storyboarding, Location scouting, casting, everything, knowing that it was probably not going to happen, which is a tremendously dispiriting and horrible feeling. And then when we actually started shooting, it was such a relief that from then on, nothing could be as difficult as the process by which we'd arrived at shooting. And it was a, bl it was a breeze. It was like a blur. Everybody loves the script. Um, I'm curious, where do you get... Not your ideas from, which is the common question, but where do you get your insults from? Because there's a lot of great banter between everybody, and it's like everybody hates everybody, but in a really good way. Well, there's a, a tradition for that. I mean, I recommend, if you have it, that you go back and read uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, the original screenplay by Bill Goldman, who was sort of my mentor, my rabbi, along with James L. Brooks. Uh, there's... There's plenty to be found in the work of these writers, these old writers, especially like uh, Goldman. Um, Walter Hill and William Goldman were two of my favorites. And if you're gonna start writing screenplays or if you already are and just want a boost or a shot in the arm, look at the structure, look at the way they're written, the style of those two authors, Walter Hill and William Goldman. Because between the two of them, they account for the bulk of the stylistic stuff I do on the page as I'm writing a screenplay. Uh, other than that, yeah. in terms of insults and China, it's just that's the fun part. I mean, the banter it has to happen. If you're doing a uh, noir picture, if you're doing a detective story, um, I think something that is lost a little bit, and I'm not going to pre pretend that I'm like the, the guy who's, what the frick is that? <laughs> I'm going to have epilepsy. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, you just, I think people like lively conversations. And the problem is, a lot of screenwriters I talk to think that natural is good. Natural is dramatic. When in truth, yeah, it has to sound natural. Maybe even capture things, wow, that's just like something I heard in a bar. But if you literally write naturalistic dialogue, I read a script last week, the dialogue was like, hey, how's it going? Pretty good. What about you? Yeah, it's good. Where are you going? Party? Party? Where? Tonight? Michelle's? Yeah, Michelle's. Oh, are you going to bring Susie? Maybe. I don't know. You have a car? I have a car. You want to come? I don't know. Should I? You should. Okay, I'll come. Why? Four pages. Nothing. <laughs> 
yeah, I can have that conversation. That sounds perfectly real to me. But it's just a waste of time. You can't write the way people actually talk in real life. You have to write the way they talk in movies and make it sound like it's real life. And so that's where you get the banter of people going back and forth. But it's slightly heightened. In everything I do, I try to stylize it so that it's a little more interesting. It's a little more lively. It's a little bit more intense of a conversation than you just have sort of sitting at a bus stop. Uh, unless the point of the scene is that these characters are not feeling like talking that day, and then you do kind of, you, you could probably take that scene I just described and make it dramatic, it, but it would be a choice to make them talk about nothing. It wouldn't just be your style of always writing that way, which is what so many people I encounter do. Is that I, you know, that's, my dad had this conversation with last night at dinner. Great, so let's everyone go, I'll go to your dad's and we'll enjoy the conversation. Meanwhile, in the movies, I want to see something interesting. Uh, the film has voiceover narration that sounds a lot like your written prose, uh, according to the article in Screenwriting, and I agree completely. How important do you think voice is, uh, certainly for you, but for somebody who's starting out? I think everybody here wants to uh, do, do, kinds, do the sorts of work and make the kinds of film that uh, convey something distinctive that you would call your own voice, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's the way to get noticed in a crowd, that if there's 100 people yelling out there's one that you kind of focus on that's distinctive, and it's usually the one who's breaking some rule or trying something interesting or different. Uh, and it's very important, I think, to have a voice because it implies that you're passionate. It implies that you, you really care, that, you know, I'm, I'm not sitting here pretending to be any guru of screenwriting, and I'm certainly not sitting here to celebrate the successes I've had or the money that I've made. I'm trying to become a better writer. I'm trying everything I can to scare the gentleman right the fuck out the door. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's really important, I think, to cultivate the things that you find particularly passionate in yourself. Like, whatever outrages you is always good. Um, <clears throat> this, this film is a lot of it's about being tough, you know, and uh, male icons and masculinity and trying to aspire to fill the shoes or to answer the call of some higher, tougher presence that we wish to be or can't, but can't fill the shoes of, that we're inept to emulate. Uh, and that was sort of what this is about. I mean, and all masculine iconography, I mean, all these action films are all about ejaculation anyway, guns exploding all the time, boom, 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 it's all sexual. Uh, so in this movie, why not make it literal? You know, he actually shoots a man with his penis at one point, you know, sort of. And it's like, yeah, that's what these movies are about anyway. That's what I think is a voice. It's, it's what I take away from the action genre when I watch it, which is different than what you'll take away. It's like, I think The Rock is shit, you know? And I know a lot of people who really like The Rock. It's a great action picture. And people say to me, you know, I really love your work, man. I really think it's great. I also like The Rock, you know? It's, it, to me, that's like, you know, I love your wife's cooking. It's delicious. Oh, the, you know what? This dog shit's pretty good, too. I love that. <laughs> it takes away you know, the compliment because it implies that there's no distinction made between what I perceive to be a very different voice. And, you know, that's why I don't want to do action. I don't want to get lumped in with a bunch of car crashes. You encouraged uh, last night writers to go out and shoot their own stuff. Uh, what's the advantage of having control of your media? Well, if something, is, uh, something goes wrong, you're to blame, and that's a good feeling. It's on you, basically. So I, I, I think it's very important, and especially if you think you have something distinctive to say, to not entrust it to somebody who mo may completely alter your intention and do something that you don't want to say. Um, I had a script completely rewritten on me by John McTiernan on Last Action Hero. It's okay, I re completely rewrote some other poor schmuck who, to this day, hounds me and calls me names. Uh, but it's just sensibility. I'm not saying that he was wrong. That's what he wanted to make. I wrote the picture I wanted to make. The director, John McTiernan, threw it out, made the picture he wanted to make. It sucked, but they, you know, that's, that's the that's show business. Uh, you should write something that you care about and then you should go to Hollywood. Don't worry about directing it just yet if you're writing. I think it's important to f first establish that you have a niche in which you can base yourself. Get an agent. 
Go to Hollywood. I said this last night, I don't know how many of you were there, but I'll say it again. I think it's desperately and sadly to you, very important. If you want to write or direct, you have to kind of go to Los Angeles. Um, I don't really know of anybody who's ever done it from here. So it's, it's kind of just, and when you get there, the horrible thing is people say, well, <clears throat> I'm here to write you know, movies I want to direct also. So, well, what do you got? He says, well, I have a few ideas. Uh, you know, I've got a treatment. It's like two pages. I said, what the hell are they talking about? You come out to L.A. and you have a treatment? You have two pages and some ideas? I mean, you have to have three scripts in your pocket, and they better be your best work. And when someone says, do you by any chance have something I can read? Boom, it's right there. And it's your best work. It's the best thing you've ever done. Uh, or the best you can do in a given moment. I also, my pet peeve is with writers who come to me and they, they see some really bad thing on TV like Charles in Charge or some sitcom and, and they say, oh, that's so awful, that show. I can do better than that. I can do at least that good, so I should be writing TV. And it seems to me that's faulty logic. I mean, that implies that Hollywood somehow owes you a career because your shitty writing is, you know, just slightly less shitty than Charles in Charge is shitty writing, you know. And say, so, do you want to get over on people? And is that the sole, you know, objective to get in to television by being mediocre? No. You, so I, I make it a point, never think about what the other guy is doing. Never think about, oh, there's so many bad movies, mine are better. Who cares? They're bad movies they got made, fine. It's ironic, it's awful, whatever it is. Just keep your eye on the, on the you know, the carrot and the stick right in front of you. Um, I think it's also important to be very positive about yourself and other people's work. Especially, I noticed when I was around film school, and I was even tempted myself, people are very caustic. They say, come out of a movie, it's, oh, that movie's not going to make a dime, you know. And I think that to me is not a miracle. You know, it's like, wait a minute, you're telling me that some kids in film school were sarcastic and caustic and really negative? Gee, what, a, what an effort that must have been for them. Or, oh, someone in Hollywood was vindictive and and petty and they criticize their friend's film, gee, well, how, that's difficult for them, isn't it? No, it's too easy to be negative. It's the easy way to go. There's nothing simpler and easier in this world to do than make fun of people's film, criticize other people's work, talk about how the world's falling to pieces, whatever. But if you come in with a positive attitude that we're all in this together, because uh, I believe that, and honestly, honestly to God, I look at you sitting, uh, watching this sort of impromptu class here, and I think, look at all those, and first off, you look like you're 12, but beyond that, there's, you're hungry. You know, you're at that place where it's all before you, you don't know you're gonna die yet. You will, by the way, but you don't know it yet. <laughs> <laughs> you think you're gonna live forever and make movies, and it's that hunger that is so profound, and, in, in a way, you just don't get it, but I would like cut off my hand just to switch places for it. the opportunity to sit where you're sitting again and look through those eyes and see it with that much freshness and purity to the vision because you get to be my age and you get jaded, you know? You learn too many lessons. And the freshness and the purity that you have right now to bring to this is, you know, it, it's, it's galvanic. If you were to work together, with, if people in this room would join their hands in a positive attitude towards the goal of making a movie, the energy would multiply a thousandfold because this room has more talent just sitting here right now than Hollywood probably in all its extremes. It's just a question of how many of you will apply it and how many of you will take it to Hollywood and use it. Um, but. You know, cherish, cherish what you got, which is your naivete. Cherish your raw talent. And get ready to be messed with and criticized and beat up and knocked down and shit upon and all these other things. But, you know, you keep your passion about you. And uh, you honestly will be fine. It will honestly work out. Um, so I recommend that you finish what you're doing here, then get your tickets and... Go out there. Wait, is it there or there? Uh, the next one is there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> question for you is at this point there. Um, do, should we open up for some questions for some folks? Sure. You have some good ones. I have a couple more in reserve if you guys don't have any. 
Yeah. I have one question. Um, in the film, there was in the very first scene, uh, he's talking to his niece, and I was wondering if that was just to establish like character, or I, it didn't really go anywhere. He talked to her one other time in the film, mm -hmm. but pretty much everything else tied in, and right. I didn't see a definitive point where that tied in. No, it doesn't. You know, it, I, is that I, one of the ten? No, no. It's it's actually something I perceive as a minor difficulty because I believe that. It's like, we don't know much about Harry's past in the movie. He grew up in Indiana, but somehow he got to New York. There's a reference to the fact that maybe he was married at one point, or tried to be. So those little details, I just chose to leave. Uh, they didn't interest me. I mean, if it's glaring enough that you noticed it, or you picked up on it as something that distracted you from the movie, then that's not good, and I, that, that would be a mistake. I hope... Uh, I hope that it's not too distracting that it actually interferes with people's ability to enjoy the film otherwise. No, it definitely wasn't. I thought it kind of helped uh, tell you who he was a little bit more. That's the only reason it's there, is just to get it quick, 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 get who he is, yeah. I don't? I'm just wondering how you started out, like, after years on the road, going to school or whatever, and then going to Indiana, and then going to Indiana, did you just move out to L.A.? Well, I, I lived in L.A. at that point. I went to UCLA. And I was trying to be, at that point, an actor. I did some really bad acting. Uh, for I was the first one killed in the movie Predator, if you remember that. Um, but basically, I just I did odd jobs. I was a temp guy. I worked for uh, as a dispatcher for a computer repair company. And uh, I was just writing on the side until finally I had a friend. I hung out with a group of buddies, all of us about a dozen, some girls, mostly guys. And together we had this group that all talked about movies and met. Late at night there was a sign in the window open 24 hours and it really truly was. Anytime that you wanted to stop by there was somebody in there doing some crazy thing, making a movie, arguing about a film. You know, uh, we had our own game of Jeopardy where we invite all the chicks over. That, it was true, we were the geek fraternity, we were the nerds. And it wasn't a true fraternity, it was just 12 people who love film. Of those 12, I'd say 10 succeeded in a fairly substantial, maybe even spectacular way, and helped each other on the way by reaching back down the ladder and pulling someone up a rung, and in turn, that person helping their friend. I think for that reason, it's important getting in to surround yourself with as many friends who are like-minded, you know, people that you share this passion for film with, who think along the lines that you do, on the same beam. Get a group of like-minded people together, not for the purpose of networking and making it with all of you, you know, it's not about using, it's about finding friends who are as excited as you are, and that makes the odds quadruple. Start a writer's group, or join a writer's group, is my usual advice, I said that last <coughs> night. Um, because you're not in it alone if you do that. Writing's a very lonely thing. Anything you can do to minimize how lonely it is to sit in a room and agonize over stuff, thinking that nobody's gonna read this or care about it. Get some friends in the same boat with you. It feels a lot safer, and you're able to open up, and I, it freed me to do better work when I wasn't thinking, oh my God, I'm, I can't do this, and no one's here to tell me I can, and the only one who's gonna read these pages is my mother, because I'm, you know, get some friends. I don't mean you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is there any truth to that story about um, the last action hero that that guy was basically doing a satire on you and Arnold Schwarzenegger, and then ironically, you both came into the process of how that you know, oh, Fuck. I'm sorry. Uh, <clears throat> no, it, that that isn't true. Actually, that's a a very interesting conceit um, on the part of some storyteller somewhere. Because the, the guy who wrote it was doing a spoof on action movies, but not necessarily my action movies, more like Commando. I didn't write Commando, I didn't write Predator. Um, so I, Zach Penn and Adam Leff were the two original writers who came up with this, the idea of a kid who goes into an action movie, who's a big Arnold fan. Um, you know, I, I yeah. I took it and, and we did a whole other version of it, a whole different way. 
And it started this big controversy because first off, the original writers then decided that they hated me with all their heart and mind and spared no expense and lost no opportunity to say so as loudly as possible in whatever piece of trash they could publish in. Uh, so whatever, you know, I don't know why they hated me so much, but I you know, I rewrote them. And that's, that's what happens sometimes as you get rewritten. Uh, Hopefully not disastrously. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, we had a, a mic with the teacher, and uh, he was talking about like there was a point where he had uh, a chance to be in Universal Studios back a lot, and now uh, he would have talked to somebody, you know, maybe things would be different now. And I think a lot of people have that kind of going on in their life if it hasn't happened already. Like, did you have a point like that? And obviously, it seems like if it did happen, like. It could have gone another way if you know if I hadn't come to California, if I hadn't attended UCLA and met the people I met. Uh, it wasn't in my blood to be a screenwriter, <coughs> certainly because I didn't understand that screenwriting was even something to consider. You know, coming from back east, I just assumed it was a whole other medium with rules so complex and intricate and difficult that no one could master it. But in fact, it's just, you know, interior, are you inside or outside? Okay, what time, is it day or is it night? And those are the rules. So given that, uh, I just, I, I fell into it because of my friends. I think there's a moment, yeah, where you kind of know that this is the, this is the point at which things were determined. And I think, some, I used to feel charmed. Every once in a while, it'll, it goes in cycles. I felt charmed when, in high school, I had all these mental problems. I spent my prom in a mental institution. But I, mean, I got out, and there was still something in my head that was really weird. But at the same time, I started winning awards for writing. And I thought, you know, maybe there is something odd about me, but it's special, and I'm charmed. And then in college, of course, I, things screw up. And you think, well, you know, what an illusion. I'm not charmed at all. In fact, I'm unlucky. And then when the screenplay thing happened, when I sold all these scripts for more money than anybody else, I thought, I'm charmed again. I mean, I've got luck on my side. Somebody's watching my shoulder. And then that ended, and I fell down and thought, that's it. That's, I guess, the best thing I'll ever do is something I already did. Boy, isn't that sad. Got back to work, rounded the keys, go back to process. Always process, because fear will haunt you. So you have a process, you just go back and you just do the thing, and you trust it, and you don't think about it. You just go with your process. And then this movie, and all of a sudden, critics like the movie. So, you know, I don't know. It goes in and out of favor, feeling like there's destiny to this, or that there's a moment, or you're charmed, or meant to do something. I think it's more just sweat. If you're willing to sweat, you'll get what you want. And then later, call it destiny, when in fact, you know, it's, it's the fact that if you didn't do it, you probably would have gone crazy. Um, someone asked Stanley Kubrick once if making, he was happy making films, and he said, no, but I'd certainly be less happy if I didn't. So, I'm not really jubilant as a person. I mean, I'm sort of, I can be. I'll show you that next time. I think you did a good job of taking whatever anger you had and applying it in the movie, because, you know, they say you're supposed to make it really hard for your characters, but you were positively brutal to all of them equally, so. It's probably a good outlet, perhaps. Yeah, I think it's it's all about getting knocked down and clubbed and then standing back up again, you know. Uh, you know the biggest compliment I, I got on the film for me was when someone said, you know, it's a comedy and I'm watching all these jokes and I'm laughing at the jokes, but then at the end when Val Kilmer is shot, I really thought he was going to die. And I thought, wait a minute, how, I'm watching this comedy. How can I think that the main character is going to get shot and die at the end? And that's good to me. That's the whole point is that you are watching the jokes, but that you're not so relaxed that you forget something could happen, you know, it's really kind of bad. Um, I love that mix. I love the idea that you can switch gears so many times in a movie. Go right out of a comic scene into one that's really kind of wrenching. And, and just, then it's like, you know, playing a, a game of back and forth and you just steer in between all the obstacles. Yeah. Where do you get your inspiration for writing? And from that, from there, like, how do you start the writing process? 
Sometimes you just have to start typing. I think. Uh, inspiration very seldom occurs. What I do, and I'll, I'll <coughs> share this with you because I think it's useful, is I, got, I have a shoebox at home. I have two of them, actually. And every time I have an idea for a scene or a scrap of dialogue or even a, just a, a snippet of, you know, an impression I have that seems to connote something in my head, I'll put it in the shoebox. And I'll let six months go by until there's all these accumulated papers in there, napkins and business cards and everything that are scribbled on, and I dump it out. And I read through all the things I've collected in six months. And uh, some, some of the things you don't even remember writing, and you can't even interpret what the hell it means. So you, you, just, you see if anything connects. You see if there's a thread that seems to run through any of the things that you've obviously been thinking about or that are occurring within your subconscious during the last six months. You see what gels, what suggests a shape. Honestly, do you ever see? I believe move, all movies are, exist already, by the way, as platonic ideals. They're the perfect version of any movie you want to think about or come up with is already there. It's just sort of chipping away everything that doesn't look like the elephant until all that's left is the elephant. If you go to see a trailer for a movie, and you, you must have done this, and you go, wow, that's going to be great. I love that trailer. That movie's going to be hot. And then you go see the movie, and it sucks. And it's the problem is that there was something suggested by the trailer. In your head, you, your mind went to work forming a shape, sort of vague, sensed if not completely seen. But those images in the trailer made you complete the shape and say, I can see a version of what that's suggesting to me that's really cool. I don't know what it is yet. I need a steam shovel to dig it out. But the, there's a bubble there, a consistent shape that now I've decided I want to see. And when they drew, did the movie, they didn't get it. But that doesn't mean the shape isn't still out there, because you could perceive it in your head. You could see what you wanted, sort of. Not specifically, but you knew it was there. And then they didn't do it. They made some other movie that didn't come up to the expectation generated by their own trailer. So the trick, I think, is to, inspiration-wise, this is another thing I do, which I don't know if I recommend or not. I, write, I try to see the trailer in my head. Um, I watch the preview as I'm writing and get the shape. I want the overall shape, not just what happens, but what the whole thing's going to feel like. If I were to cut a mental trailer for the film that would generate the best possible explication of the shape that exists that I'm trying so desperately to define, what would those images be to suggest more fully that particular shape? And then I go to work and I try to create that. Wow, that's pretentious shit. <laughs> <laughs> but it is connecting the dots then, right? Yep. Human beings are pattern recognition machines. I think when I saw the film, I felt that it was a series of really good things connected. By, and I'm, mystery things for me are really hard to, to get around, so I'm always fooled. It doesn't matter what the ending is. But I think uh, I haven't been as excited about a movie in a really long time while watching it. I felt very tense. And, that, and yet you're letting us off the hook every minute or so with a laugh. And the laughs are gigantic, guys, so be prepared. Um, so I would say it's one of the best movies we've seen in a while, and um, the feedback I got from the kids that went were like, yeah, I can't remember the last time I enjoyed a movie as much. Well, so that's, that's nice. Tell them um, I'll give them a dollar. Yeah, one dollar. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody have any last ones for Shane? And we're probably wrapping it up here. Yes, um, you mentioned earlier about the importance of purity of passion, yep. idea, et cetera. Um, and if you, you know, have been around a while and that purity starts to fade, I mean, how does one maybe go about tapping into it again, or do you believe that's really even possible? Of course it's possible. That's what this movie is about, by the way. If you go see it, it's about tapping into uh, what you saw through the eyes of a child and capitalizing on a belief that only children have and adults lose by the time they get to you know, Hollywood. But it depends. You, you have to touch bottom every once in a while. You have to remember why you're here, why you started in the first place. Why I started writing, I mean, this is stupid, but you, we'll show you something, I think. I don't, I'll just tell it real quick. I read a comic book a story when I was a kid one time. And it's a story, it starts with this grave. And there's a house up on a hill in the distance, but we're not at the house. We're in the, in the middle of the woods at this grave, and a, a hand comes out. It's all rotted, and it's a skeleton. And then it, this thing crawls up out of the grave. It's a walking dead zombie. 
and uh, it's huge and it starts to shamble up the hill towards the house and as it does you get these flashes, little bits and pieces from what's left in its brain which is decayed. But the little sharp like one panel uh, moments that show you how this kid was sort of born as this retarded crazy uh, child of these abusive parents who just used him and you know shots of him hugging his teddy bear while his parents loom over him and they beat him and they hurt him and they kick him and accidentally finally they kill him and take him to the woods and bury him they kill their own child so now here he is full grown coming up the hill towards them he bursts into the house the father runs out screams grabs a gun he hits the father knocks him aside the father goes over the railing falls breaks his neck he's dead he goes up the stairs, the mother's at the top of the steps. She tries to run at him, misses. She falls down the steps, breaks her neck, she's dead. You think, there, he's got his revenge. But the zombie keeps walking all the way to the top of the stairs. He turns and goes down the hall. And he goes into his old bedroom, and he reaches and he gets his teddy bear. And the last shot is him in the grave, and he's pulling the sand, and he's just got his bear now. That's all he wanted. He didn't want to kill his parents at all. He just couldn't sleep because he needed his teddy bear. Um, and that affected me so profoundly when I was a kid. That was, had such a powerful effect on me. It's a comic book, for Christ's sake. But that's what I mean. It doesn't matter where your inspiration comes from. It's learning to see through the eyes of a kid again, whatever that takes. And uh, go back to your books that you love, that made you want to be a writer. Go back to your source material. Um, if it seems a little stale or if your tastes have changed, indulge them by reading some new authors. You know, reinvigorate whatever it is that made you want to do this in the first place. Uh, I don't think anyone has ever exhausted their supply of energy for something as infinitely explorable as you know, writing stories. If you don't, I, like, I want to do something besides action. Great, so now I'm trying. Um, yeah, I just, there's an old expression, you have to remember to touch bottom in order to stay on top. Always go back every once in a while to your base and say, why am I here? Let's not forget why I'm doing this. You know, when you're in your fancy car with three blondes and, you know, everyone's throwing money in Vegas, stop and say, wait a minute, why am I here? This isn't why I'm here. And you remember your roots, and you always go back and have to touch them. <clears throat> Last one, what? That's a good note to end on. Uh, nobody has any more? Guys, uh, let's put you. our hands together for Shane.